David Fritsch, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Fritsch. I uh, am a worker on the ISPACY project. I work on the spent fuel. I work as a F R I T C H. Um, I do industrial safety, so OSHA stuff, not nuclear stuff, but I'm out there. Um, and uh, I may not have a job at tomorrow for what I'm about to say, but that's fine. Because uh, I made a, a promise to my daughter that if no one else talked about what happened on Friday, that I would. <clears throat> about 12.30, August 3rd, we were downloading. And uh, the canister didn't download, but the rigging came all the way down. Uh, it was gross errors on the part of two individuals. <clears throat> there were gross errors on the part of two, of two, two individuals, the operator and the rigger. Um, that are inexplicable. Um, so what we have is, is a canister that could have fallen 18 feet. <clears throat> That's a bad day. That happened. And you haven't heard about it. That's not right. My friend here is right. Public safety should be first. And I've been around nuclear for many years. It's not. Behind that gate, it's not. Here's a few things that I've observed in the three months I've been here. Squee, um, the safety conscious work environment where people are constantly uh, given um, encouragement to raise concerns. It's not repeatedly or even, th I've never even received squee training since I've been on site. That's not standard for a nuclear site. Um, operational experience is not shared. That problem had occurred before, but it wasn't shared with the crew that was working. <clears throat> We're undermanned. We don't have the, 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 the proper personnel to get things done safely, and certainly undertrained. Uh, many of the experienced supervisors, the, what we call uh, CLSs, cast load supervisors, once they understand the project and how everything works, are often sent away and we get new ones. They don't understand as well as, as even the craft, basic construction craft. A lot of them that haven't been around nuclear before <clears throat> are performing these tasks. Not technicians, not highly trained, not, not thorough briefs. Um, this is an engineering problem. What happened is um, inside of that cask, there is a guide ring at four feet down, and it's to guide that canister down correctly to be centered in the system. Well, it actually caught that. And from what I understand, it was hanging by about a quarter inch. Thank you very much for your <clears throat> So, yeah, I'm not trying to cut him off, Ray. He stopped at so, the okay. end of the time, and so I asked, thanked him for his comment. Sure, sure. I, I just have if a you few, want to very uh, briefly finish yes, yeah. the additional and I, I comments. Think, I mean, obviously the point is uh, clear. Um, as people said, Edison's not forthright about what's going on. I'm sure they'll tell you that they were going to bring this out once it was analyzed, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure they've been preparing what they would answer if it comes out. Um, and I came here tonight to see if this event would be shared with the community, and I was, I was disappointed to see that it was not. And I want to um, thank the, the community of San Clemente. It's a beautiful, wonderful community with amazing people. You've been great to me. My family's with, here with me for the month. Um, and unless Edison and Holtec commit to defining success on this project as safety, and I'm, a, I'm not talking about any of the, really the concerns that were voiced today, I'm just talking about downloading, getting the, the fuel out of the building safely. Um, and, 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 and are we going to address what would have happened to that canister if it would have fallen, even if the shell wasn't penetrated, now will, will, will they take it in a repository site? Um, but the question is, will, will Edison and Holtec commit to defining success primarily in terms of nuclear safety? And there will, be, will there be transparency, commitment to safety, and the financial commitment to make sure that it's done successfully? Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, Donna Gilmore, the floor is yours. We have the same question every time. What are you going to do with a leaky canister? 
the only options are put it in the pool. We now know these canisters are being loaded so damn hot, you can't do that. The only other option, as you told me on a sign conversation, Tom, is a, is a hot cell. You don't have any plans to do that. The other option you talked about offline and that you said is a some kind of an overpack cast. It, you, there's no thermal analysis done for that. No one has approached the NRC to do that. We've got 15-year-old canisters here. The only plan that I know you're actually doing is you've asked Areva, your vendor, to no longer have to report uh, the radiation levels coming out of the outlet air vents. The only possible reason to not share those levels is to hide them. So instead of getting public radiation monitoring, you're going behind and getting the NRC to approve stopping measuring those radiation levels. If there's leaks in the canister, they will go out those outlet air vents. I did some research. The Edison NRC has already approved this for, Cal for Calvert Cliffs. Their canisters are 25 years old. So the real plan, guys, everybody, the real plan is to hide the leaks. San Southern California Edison is the company that ran the first commercial reactor in the country, Santa Susana. They brag about that. What they don't tell you is that reactor leaked into the community in Simi Valley. They hid the leaks for 20 years. A student doing research at UCLA found the documents. So they have a history of hiding leaks. The 17 day was hidden. They told us it didn't release to the public. So they have absolutely no intention to do anything. They know these canisters can leak. And what do they do? They buy more of them. These were not designed to last. It's, forget talking about transport. I want to know what you're going to do when those canisters start leaking. And we have no answers. You're not, you're, you know, you need, you need, the only option is to buy thick wall casts. Take that trust fund money, take that $4.3 billion and do it right. Get the thick cast so we can, we can sleep at night, so we can live in Southern California. You know, the people in New Mexico, they don't want this stuff, but they're going to get it anyway because when these canisters start leaking and exploding, that is stuff is going to go airborne and head inland. It's, it's going to go everywhere. Each one of these cans is roughly a Chernobyl nuclear disaster, and they can explode. There's, they, these are pressure vessels, and there are no pressure monitoring on them. There is no pressure relief valve. The Three Mile Island cans had that. So, so you don't even have that on these containers. When you're loading, you know the pressure when you put the helium in. But after that, there, there's, there's no monitoring at all for pressure. The NRC gives exemptions from mechanical standards. So I have a handout if anybody didn't get it. Um, but it's time to talk, talk about anything else until I answer this question. Thank, Thank you very you. much for your comments, Donna Gilmore. Next is Gary Hedrick and then uh, Torgan Johnson. Gary Hedrick, the floor is yours. Thank you. Gary Hedrick, H-E-A-D-R-I-C-K, with San Clemente Green. And um, I'm just emotionally touched and honored to be here with someone who was bold enough to speak the truth to power. I appreciate that so much, and that's what got me involved. I think we all heard that story before, but I just can't can't tell you how important it is to have people like that and how important it is for us to listen to them. Ah, oh, man, it just brings back memories of whistleblowers or heroes, in my mind, that told me about things that we would never have heard of before. There was, the, uh, there was an incident where, on a Thanksgiving day, I think it was 2011, uh, steel I-beam dropped into a spent fuel pool and could have, if it had gone straight down, it could have damaged the fuel. And instead, it just glanced off, and they went in with hazmats and protective measures. It was a close call, and no one would have ever heard of it. And here, you know, I'm just, this is not what I intend to speak about, but this is, accidents do happen. We have to listen to people that are trustworthy, that really have the public's interest in mind. And Gregory Yasko, the former NRC chairman, who was in charge during the Fukushima accident, he had a life-changing event to understand that there's 
another side of the story that he had to come to grips with. And he told us just last week on KPBS that the spent fuel pools, this, I mean the spent nuclear fuel that's being stored in these silos on the beach are likely to never move. And in his opinion, he thinks the NRC does not put public safety first. I mean, that's from the top guy. And if we don't listen to that, then maybe all we need to talk about is radiation monitoring because we know the damn stuff's going to get into the environment. If we continue this path, we, we need to just analyze how we're going to deal with the accident and forget about transportation and everything else. We've got to talk about different kind of canisters, different ways of handling it. We need a hot cell on site if there's a leaky canister that if we can't use a spent fuel pool to remedy that situation. I mean, we have to get realistic about what we're doing and not do a lot of wishful thinking and, you know, outdated movies about things that don't even take into account things we've learned since the 70s. You know, these are higher, hotter, heavier, you know, canisters that were just pretending like, oh, this is all going to work out fine. And when it doesn't, where are we all going to be? What are we going to say to our future generations and people who could have prevented this? You know, and I do want to thank you, our council member Stephen Swartz, for being persistent on this stuff. But you know, the only cure for this is prevention, and we got to listen to people that are trustworthy and not the industry. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, next is Torgan Johnson, and then Jeff Steinmetz. Torgan Johnson. T-O-R-G-E-N-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. I'm a father of four. I'm a Harvard-trained urban planner in North County, San Diego. I'm going to give you a quote addressing this man's comment. The Prime Minister, Nayed Khan, we hosted him at eight events in the United States and Japan. Quote, severe nuclear accidents happen, so plan for them, unquote. In a recent KPBS TV interview, the former chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Dr. Gregory Yasko, said the spent fuel at San Onofre will be buried and left on site indefinitely. Given the opposition in New Mexico to Holtec centralized storage project and the technical and legal challenges of opening Yucca Mountain, it's imperative that these discussions that you're having with the public be frank and open to address the long-term consequences and environmental impacts of permanent waste storage here at San Onofre. When we do get real with each other, you'll start to appreciate why the dangerous nature of this waste has led to the public's persistence in requesting sensible safety measures and emergency plans for leaking or exploding high-level radioactive waste canisters. Spent fuel pools should be retained on site because they're the only option we have for one of these accidents. The seismic and tsunami risks here are far greater than what Edison's hired geologist has told the public. A recent report presented by Dr. Mark Legg at the 11th National Conference on Earthquake Engineering this June of 2018 describes the offshore and onshore earthquake fault system and tsunami risk at the power plant to be far more serious than Edison's contracted geologist reported. The reason I'm here today is in this public interest fight is uh, my family was involved in a coastal access fight back in the 70s. Up in Malibu, private interest fenced off the beach for miles to prevent the public from having access to the beach. And when there was a fight to get an access point, they piled a, a whole bunch of dog crap on the access point. What we're looking at right now is we're looking at a regulated monopoly that we pay for, either as ratepayers or as taxpayers handling this waste, are dumping exactly the same thing, 1,628 metric tons of the most dangerous crap in the world on a beach that my family cherishes. And an accident with that waste could render these beaches uh, unaccessible in the area around it Un, uh, uninhabitable forever. That's what we're talking about here. So, in short, uh, 
We're asking for the suspension of the continued loading of this fuel plan until we can get sensible on siting and containment. The public is right. You just heard it, everybody. Okay? We're right. We know it's going to be stuck here. Let's start. Number one, containment. Get it right. Number two, siting. Get it right. Thank you very okay. much for your for your comment. Next is Jeff Steinmetz, and then I see Sarah Brady. You're on the list again, but I saw you were reading your comments. So if you want to share the fuller comments with us, I'll make sure they're part of the public record. So Jeff Steinmetz, and then Krista Gostenhofer. All right, thank you. My name is Jeff Steinmetz. Um, I uh, I work in the public sector, and that I sell software to help utilities and. Um, municipalities and counties to better manage their fleet equipment. A big part of managing that fleet equipment is to actually do preventive maintenance inspections, okay? That helps maintain your assets, it keeps them safe, and it helps them to last longer. So what we have with the system that's going in and the one that exists today is one that you cannot inspect. No other public sector is doing anything like this. Why is it we're taking one of the most dangerous substances in the world and deciding, okay, we're just going to shoot the crap? So, <clears throat> after what was just said here today, Tom, you got some splaining to do. Seriously, it's an embarrassment. Now, talking about holding that stuff up over the that space and the risk of it dropping. One of the things that was mentioned in that video, I should say that phony baloney sales presentation, was that they filled the canister up with water and a couple of steel, steel rods and then crashed it. Well, know this, mass times velocity equals momentum. It's simple multiplication, okay? The density or the weight of water is one gram per cubic centimeter. The density or weight of plutonium is 19.82. So we're looking at about a factor of 19. That's why I say that was a stupid sales presentation. Because you're looking, they're not even doing the math and they're expecting that all of us can't do any simple math. It's fourth grade stuff. So now, take that example that they gave you filled with water and put the real quantity of weight and fuel into it and drop it from where it was hanging. It's really ugly, Tom. I, I want to ask Tom, excuse me, can I ask Tom Coughlin, who is the representative from Camp Pendleton and is their land, to comment in this area. And, and in addition, Tom, some comments were made tonight to the effect that you were not plugged in to decision making on Camp Pendleton. So I don't know to what degree you want to respond to that, but, but in past meetings, you've made a variety of comments about what the Navy is actually planning here, whether the Mesa site is open for becoming a spent fuel storage site. And so maybe you could comment very briefly about that. Um, <clears throat> you've, you've got several things at work here. First, about Four months ago, the assistant commandant, or the deputy commandant of the Marine Corps for installations, and the chief general counsel of the Marine Corps uh, sent two letters: uh, one to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to advocate for removal of the fuel rods as quickly, uh, the, all the fuel off site as quickly as possible. That the Marine Corps' position was: do it safely, do it quickly, and remove the fuel permanently. Where the fuel is stored on site is the decision of the NRC, and the Marine Corps, as part of the executive branch of the government, has responsibilities to do Marine Corps things and not a whole lot of uh, technical expertise on nuclear things, certainly not nuclear power generation things. Nuclear defense things, sure, that's decontamination. That's a different thing entirely. But in terms of where the site, where that fuel goes, we rely upon the expertise of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to say what is safe, what is technically possible, what is good science, and how we can get it out of here as quickly as possible. The Marine Corps' position is get it out of here as quickly as possible. 
Now, the next thing I've heard several times is what about the security issue? The other letter went to Southern California Edison for a detailed review, both unclassified and classified, mm -hmm. of the scenarios uh, that, we, uh, that you might have to deal with in terms of on-site uh, response, uh, emergency response uh, to an emergency that might occur to the deactivated, decommissioning Song's plant, including the on-site storage as is currently envisaged. Uh, I think that... Okay, thank you. Does that get it? Regulations require dry storage to uh, be able to be re, uh, retrieved. Uh, and these don't have that capability. So are you in violation of the regulations? No, so again, this is one warrants a longer term discussion. The original licenses or certificates retrieved retrievability. Now, at the last meeting where we talked about unloading, or the first meeting of the quarter where I talked about the shim issue and unloading a canister, I may have confused the issue. I was not aware at the time that anybody had unloaded a canister. We have found one site that has unloaded a bolted canister. It is a similar process to a welded canister, okay? and, and so it can be done. It's done typically in a spent fuel pool. So the NRC has changed their view of things uh, in their continued storage rule, which I'll be glad to bring in and discuss more thoroughly. The NRC does not require decommissioned plants to maintain spent fuel pools, even with dry cast storage. And I can refer you to David Lockbaum of the Union of Concerned Scientists, who would tell you a spent fuel pool is not needed for an isfacy only or decommissioned site. Now, this warrants a broader discussion where there's chance for good dialogue and discussion on this. We're in compliance today. What Areva is doing on one of the older licenses for our older system is cleaning up some of these requirements that the NRC no longer insists upon. I think that that's where the comment came from. Lying, so, excuse yes. me. Stop lying, please. Please, Stop please, lying. please, please. please. Your license item eight on your certificate of approval requires the ability what? to unload back in the pool. That license is active now. That yes. is well, that, I agree trip. with that. I agree with that. And that's what Areva's... You're going to go and get an exemption after you get the Don, fuel out of the pool. Donna, that's your plan. Let me suggest that there's a constructive well, way... You know, when we have no opportunity... Let me suggest that there's a constructive way to handle this, which is, why don't you send me a letter with that's, that your because concerns about... Because then the people about, here are not going to know the truth.